All right. So we have you here in the room and we have some people in the Zoom. So hello, Zoom people. Um, I have posted the lecture for this class from last year on the wiki. And it's so good that we can just go home, okay? So we just watch it and then we sort it. Uh, Christopher said it's not so good to watch, but I watched it yesterday. I like it. You, you'll be fine. Um, so I thought, uh, because the video is already there, I thought I will kind of uh, redo it, but I will redo it with a little bit different focus, okay? So I encourage you to watch it from uh, last year. Uh, it's the same content, the same material, but I will kind of uh, put emphasis on slightly different things such that I don't entirely repeat myself because that's super boring. So the slide deck is similar. Uh, so please join the uh, mentee and we will, let's see. And whoops, wrong button. Uh, and we will uh, we will go on with the with the material. But as I said, I will kind of put emphasis on slightly different things, and then you can watch the last year content for an update. Okay, so who am I? Who am I? Um, I let me see. This one doesn't work. Uh, it's super slow, but it works. No, it doesn't work. Okay, never mind. Um, I will kind of manually be clicking here. So uh, my name is Mariusz. I'm a lecturer. Uh, I am also a head of the uh, Bachelor in Programming degree. So I haven't entirely designed it myself, but I was part of the design. Um, and I used to teach cloud. I used to teach game programming. I used to teach graphics. I used to teach a lot of uh, programming courses. I teach this course and I teach a master course about decentralized technology. I'm focusing on decentralized technologies, which are systems which can be autonomous and which can work without a kind of a single point of failure. Um, so I'm interested in uh, blockchain technology. I'm interested in peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology. Um, and we do some research projects in collaboration with uh, police and law enforcement in tracking cryptocurrencies, for example. All right, so that's me. Um, so I talked a little bit about my research. I'm also a keen programmer, so I do some programming for fun and um, I'm teaching programming. Um, I'm interested in the theory of programming and theory of programming languages and how we can make programming uh, better. So then um, the first question is, for you, some of the quiz questions are uh, open and some are kind of uh, for, for points. So what do I love doing besides programming? Uh, okay. <laughs> So the, the biggest thing I like doing uh, besides programming is climbing. Yeah, it's on the list, but that's not the highest one. Um, climbing is good. Running is good. I don't do much um, gaming. So paragliding, yes, some of you know me. Uh, that's the same photo from last year. Um, that's me in uh, Nepal. Uh, I've been paragliding in Himalayas uh, for a couple of times. Uh, last year we were in uh, in Beer in India. Um, it turned out to be fantastic. Um, you know, five six thousand meter peaks, uh, really high altitude. You can spend seven eight hours in the air. Um, it's great. So I encourage you uh, to get some cool hobbies while you're students, and then that will last you for life. All right. So who are you? So in in three words. What can you tell me about yourself? Like, um... Uh... 
it's a bit of a philosophical question, I guess. <laughs> you are all students. Uh, you are aspiring programmers, yes. Um, some are you from France. Some of you are boys, yes. <laughs> Some of you have an exchange here. Yeah, good. So we kind of got, got to know each other a little bit, uh, I guess. Cool. Odin, uh, I doubt it. Cool, all right, so let's move on. So what programming languages are you comfortable programming in? That gives us a little bit of a overview of where your skills are and kind of what background you're coming from. All right, some of you already know Golang. Okay, so uh, yeah, Christopher also asked me to remind you that this slot is 2005. It's a cloud computing course. It's not a 2006 um, uh, advanced programming course, but I will be referring to some of uh, some of the some of you who take the advanced programming. So as you see, there are two gaps here, <laughs> and the choice for languages for 2006 is kind of to fill those two gaps exactly. All right, so we have a majority of you kind of familiar with C++. Uh, we have kind of a Java and Python. I presume it's probably from a B data background. And some of you already were exposed to, to Golang, so nothing unexpected. Uh, we have uh, JavaScript, which is kind of good for uh, web and uh, browser development. And we have some others. So the next question is, uh, what is the other? Uh, so, so say, what those other languages are, which were not on the list, or what languages you, you would like to learn. Um, so some of you would like to learn Haskell, then I invite you to program pro, programming, advanced programming 2006, Go, we will cover that here. Uh, more C++, Rust. French would be useful, yep. F sharp, F sharp will be fine once you know Haskell. It's just sort of a slightly different syntax. Kotlin is good. You will learn those of you who will take uh, mobile programming uh, in the fifth semester, then you, you will learn Kotlin. Cool. Okay. Cobol, yeah, Cobol is still used in the banking. And it's actually quite highly paid. Um, all right. Assembly, yep, that's good. There are also some variants of assembly languages for um, bytecode um, VMs, like for Java or for um, .NET, C Sharp. So if you are kind of a Java programmer, I encourage you to kind of learn the, the Java assembly also. All right, so let's move on. Overview of Go. So the language has been designed by three people. Uh, Rob Pike is um, an engineer, in, like all of them are kind of engineers in Google, uh, but uh, this one is like a real engineer in Google. And those two are kind of a senior people who have done something else in life and now work for Google. Um, and it has been designed to be a kind of a server side programming language. It's kind of a weird concept, uh, a language designed to write software which runs on a server, right? So for example, JavaScript, this was kind of designed to run on a client side on the browser and Golang is kind of designed specifically to, um, for you to write code which runs as a service, which runs as a kind of a server. Um, <clears throat> 
So it's, it is a descendant of a C family of languages. So here we have a little bit of a history. We see every, everybody is kind of following uh, Algol um, as a kind of a grandfather. And then we have a kind of a C and Pascal. They sort of split. Um, and we have kind of a Pascal line of, uh, of um, uh, developments. And then we have a C. Uh, and then we have kind of a something which is kind of a little bit odd. Uh, this odd thing with Squeak and New Squeak is um, concurrency languages, which were designed to be specifically designed for concurrent processing. So for systems which have multiple moving parts and they have to coordinate between those moving parts. And Go kind of inherits from that line of research and th this line of languages and tries to incorporate some of the features for con con concurrency into the language itself. So you kind of have sort of a three three ideas. You have a structured programming, kind of a functional um, procedural feel from this line. You have a C with kind of a low level feel uh, of, of C language. And then you have uh, this concurrency from, from those uh, languages like uh, Squeak and New Squeak. Um, those, by the way, <laughs> those are quite fun languages to, to work with. So if you are kind of interested, look, ha have a look. Okay, um, next question. So, Ken Thompson invented which language? You have three answers. All right, so while you're answering. I think the choices were not displayed. The choices are A, B, C, D. Oh, yeah. So A, B, C, D. So he actually invented B. Uh, so B was a language which Ken Thompson designed and invented. And he was a friend of Richie. And Richie said, yeah, that's quite a cool language. But I sort of like some to have some something else, uh, slightly different features. And then Richie designed uh, C. So B is kind of a directly precursor of C. Uh, and um, you know, Richie from the Carnegie and Richie book, uh, Design C. So if you go to Ken Thompson, uh, this guy is uh, a senior uh, engineer at Google. Uh, he's 79 years old and he is the father of B. So that's how he looked in 2019. And then the main, 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 main guy behind Go is uh, Rob Pike. So again, Rob Pike is looks like this, uh, and he's uh, 67. So those are kind of a uh, senior people, right? Um, all right. So a little bit of a history, memory lane. Um, so when I was a student, those guys were a little bit older than me, and they were kind of uh, idols. They they were kind of uh, you know um, you look up to those people, to those engineers. I don't know to whom you look up now. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit. All right, so LoveSite scored the best. So why Go was designed? Uh, Go was designed for productivity. So at Google, they have really large projects and they have really large teams and they have teams of various skills. So they have teams of newbies and teams of experts and they wanted to have a language which was kind of uh, improving the productivity of those large teams for the services and server side code that they write. So motivation was the productivity of, of teams and then how to achieve that, how to achieve productivity. Well, one thing they've done, they decide design a language which has a very rich standard library such that for everything they needed to code, they don't need any additional dependencies. They can just use the language with standard libraries. So that reduces a lot of this messiness of dealing with um, dependencies. If any of you did any projects with JavaScript and with Node.js, you know the kind of a dependency hell and the kind of upgrade hell and the chain of dependencies, this being incompatible with this one, but this one needs this library and it's kind of a mess. So here is like, okay, it's all gone. All you need is in the language, you don't need any dependencies. So most of the things they do don't require any dependencies. The second thing they've done is they have those large projects and they have to continuously rebuild them. And the compiling time is basically you press compile and you kind of need to wait, right? So in the old days, when I was a student, you press compile 
and you go to make yourself lunch <laughs> because that was, you know, at least half an hour. Um, but that is kind of unexpected, uh, um, undesirable these days. So um, Golang, you will see, is, 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 has really fast compile times for li large and complex projects. Um, so they really put emphasis that it has to compile fast. Um, and then they, they, of course, integrated a lot of modern features, which you expect from a modern programming language. Like it has an integrated tool, tool chain. It has integrated um, uh, tooling support. It has uh, cross-platform support as well. So those are the features which uh, were kind of a design principles for Go. Um, so it is a compiled language. It's not interpreted like um, some other scripting languages. It's statically typed. Um, it's imperative, structured, and based on functions. Um, it has a managed memory, so that simplifies some of the language constructs because the programmer doesn't need to take care of the memory management themselves. It's kind of a taking care by the runtime system. We'll talk a little bit about that in comparison to C. So even though Golang kind of feels a little bit like C, it is really different because it has a garbage collector built in, which means you don't need to ca take care of your memory allocations and memory deallocations. The language and the runtime system takes care you know, for you for that. Um, and that is a little bit weird. So some things that are kind of illegal, for example, in C or C++, like when you allocate um, some space in your function and then you return, um, like you, you have a static, I, I will show you later. You have a static allocation inside the body of a function and then you return the function, that static allocation there is kind of gone the moment you quit your function. But at Golang, the runtime system checks, are you using it outside the function? And, and if you do, it will create automatically a kind of a dynamic memory for you with a pointer. And if you don't, it will deallocate it, right? So the choice of whether the memory is static or dynamic is not done by you, it's done by your usage of what you really need to achieve. And then the runtime system works out what you want, which is a little bit, I mean, it's nice, but for C and C++ programmers, it feels kind of counterintuitive. Like some code feels like that should be illegal, but it is legal. Um, so, and it has concurrency built in. So we're not gonna cover it this uh, in the, today, but we will talk about concurrency in a subsequent uh, lecture. Um, so it has some constructs for, for concurrency. Uh, Golang, like most modern languages, including Rust, doesn't have actually inheritance. So some of, the, some of you are familiar with object-oriented programming and object-oriented programming was really hot, you know, in 60s and 70s. And for many years, it was thought to be like the, uh, a really good thing. Uh, but some features of object orientation turned out to be counterproductive. And one of those is actually deep nested kind of inheritance uh, chains. And modern programming languages are kind of going away from that because it turned out it's like counterproductive. So Golang doesn't have inheritance at all, uh, but you can achieve inheritance like behavior through composition and through interfaces. Um, so we will talk a little bit about it later. Okay, so um, it, it does feel like a modern programming language. Um, so it has a, a rich um, ecosystem. It has very good abstractions um, and it's easy maintenance. And it's also easy to come back to the language. So even if you don't touch it for some time, coming back to the language is easy because it's relatively simple. Uh, and it has a very simple idiomatic patterns. Um, and it has an excellent tooling support. So we're gonna see uh, some of it um, shortly. So it has uh, documentation, a uh, tool chain building, linters, um, uh, modular kind of uh, dependency tracker, uh, verifying your code, uh, fixing some typical idiomatic problems with your code, uh, code formatting, of course, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so now a little bit more um, kind of a thinking question. What is important in programming? What do you think? Like when you are doing software development or when you're doing programming, what kind of elements are important? What, what do you need to uh, consider? Some of, some of them I already talked about um, when Google was designing a new programming language. Um, so um, performance is there. 
<clears throat> efficiency testing uh, practices so so um some things relate to programming as a as an activity like uh, thinking and problem solving and decision making and so on and some of them relate to kind of the programming as a construction of software uh, and uh, uh, what I meant in this question is more of a construction of software. So performance, uh, scalability, yes, maintenance, uh, compile time, those things are kind of important in the as a kind of a overall activity, right? Uh, documentation, readability, yes, stability. Yeah, all all of those are, are really good. Um, yeah, keyboard, we, we talk a little bit about it later. Uh, all right, so those are, are kind of a really good, um, really good suggestions. I have a summary of, of them based on my kind of a summary. So I think productivity is important, how easy, and how fast can you pro produce the solution? How, how easy is to get out what you are building, right? So productivity in general is like one category. Uh, the second category is maintenance. So what, what is maintenance? Maintenance is like fixing bugs, is updating the code uh, for change requirements, is uh, deployment, uh, adding new features, maintaining security and the dependencies and so on. So all of those tasks come kind of under the maintenance umbrella. Uh, bugs are kind of in both, right? If if you have a language which encourages you to have bugs, then you have to spend time fixing them and then you have kind of a lower productivity. But if you have language which discourages you or prevents you making bugs, then you spend a little bit more time producing kind of a code which compiles, but then once code compiles, you almost never have bugs, right? So there are some languages which are on one side of the spectrum and some languages which are on the other. So for example, JavaScript is really easy to write code because almost everything works. You don't even have a compiler, um, but it's also very easy to have bugs and th behaviors which are kind of unexpected or behaviors that you did not intend, right? And Haskell on the other ex extreme is really hard to have code which compiles because it's very, particular and very um, picky, same with Rust. But once you have code that compiles, it almost always does what you intend it to do and you almost never have bugs, right? So you have sort of languages. So where Go is, Go is kind of a little bit in the middle. It's, it's better than Python or JavaScript, but it's not as strict as um, um, Haskell and you, or, or Rust, but you, most of the uh, memory management bugs are out. You will not have memory bugs. What bugs you may have are related to concurrency, for example, or race conditions. All right, so what's the final category is performance. Of course, performance sometimes matters. Some, I, I mean, performance always matters, but uh, most of the time we need kind of a human level performance, which means the reaction time of the software can take, you know, milliseconds or seconds and that's okay uh, unless you're working on a real-time systems or games where the performance is really important right so we we never really produce software to work as fast as possible uh, although that that changes a little bit because um, if we consider performance in terms of speed only that's kind of a one dimension but we can also consider performance in terms of speed and battery usage or electricity usage. And then we kind of factor in some sustainability things. And then you're trying to find a trade-off. You have a kind of a two, two dimensions now, and you're trying to find a sweet spot, which means it's kind of a not too slow, but also cost the least in terms of electricity usage, right? If you go to the extreme, if you want something to be as fast as possible, you always go to the extreme with the kind of uh, electricity usage most of the time and so on. So it, the curve is never linear. It's usually there is some sort of a sweet spot where you want to be. So performance, you kind of need to consider what does that mean? Um, is that only speed or is it, for example, memory or uh, sustainability aspects, right? 
Okay, so um, who knows what linter is? Okay, not not many people. Uh, that that was what I learned from uh, last year that people don't uh, know what linters are. Um, so so it's a machine for removing things. Uh, all right, so let's check what Google thinks. Linting is a process of performing static analysis on the source code to flag patterns that might cause errors or other problems. As an application progresses through the various stages, of development, code quality becomes critical and linter is like a part of improving the code quality. So it is good, good definition. Um, linter is kind of a, a set of tools or a, a tool which checks your source code and picks up all the little things that should be fixed. So if you're following, for example, a variable naming convention, it checks if everywhere you follow the convention. If you follow a certain bracket convention or certain um, uh, memory usage patterns, it checks if, if, it's, if it is consistent. Um, so there are different rules. Uh, some rules relate to the source code itself, like for example, the length of line or the bracket placement or the how you nest your if statements and so on. Some relate to the complexity of the code, like if you have six levels deep if statements, it says, look, your complexity level is too high, you should rewrite it such as it's easier to read, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So linters, it's, it's kind of a general term, which means um, fixing everything that can be easily fixed, which improves quality and overall reduces the maintenance costs and makes your software more interchangeable with your team and with, with yourself as well, because it makes your code kind of a consistent, consistently looking and following all the kind of rules that your team set up. And different programming languages have different rules built in and also different teams follow different conventions. And you can use linter to enforce it, right? Linters are built in into your integrated development environments, into your IDEs. So even though you didn't know what linter is, all of you used the linters before because that's what highlights shit in your uh, editor in your IDE, right? It complains about certain things uh, or suggests, oh, rewrite this to, to this because it's kind of easier to read. So linters are kind of uh, often transparent. You don't really think about them but they kind of work with your IDE and they do a lot of good work for you to improve the quality of your source code. All right, so um, so tooling in Golang is, uh, is quite simple and it's built in. Um, I will not demonstrate like how that, that, that works, but most of it is already built into the IDE that you will be using. And some of it, it's, um, you can achieve the same from the command line. So uh, in the other video, I've done some sort of um, uh, walk through all those tools. So go format, format your, your code. Um, I will kind of uh, make a case though, that if you, uh, because it, it is kind of important. So um, I forked the, I forked the repository for this course and I will um, create a folder. So I will make, um, I will make a directory, uh, come on, hello world, uh, we'll go there. And if I uh, edit uh, like a, a, a simple fundamental hello world um, program, um, you will see that the brackets in Golang are placed in the line of the, of where the opening bracket is. As you're probably familiar, there are two kind of uh, bracket conventions. One convention is like this. Uh, Java is using this one and most programming languages use these days this one, but there is like a C, C++ convention, which is using this type of brackets um, where you open the bracket on an empty line and then you have kind of nothing in that line and then you follow, right? And some people prefer this, some people prefer the other. And most of the time, it's just a matter of convention. So in most languages, it's just a matter of convention of what you do. In Golang, the designers of the language decided that it's such a big deal that they 
make it a compiler error. It's not a linting thing. A compiler will complain that you misplace the bracket, right? Uh, so it's not even a linter thing. It's a compiler thing. Um, I don't know. I, you know, everybody has their own personal preferences and some people like the other style more. Um, I was kind of agnostic. I, I was fine with both really. Um, even though most of my life I coded in C and it was the other convention, but this one feels fine too. So the coding convention for brackets is a compiler thing, not the linter thing. Um, okay, so then you, you have some tools. So if I mess up, uh, if I mess the formatting, um, like it, it's not properly formatted. And if I save it, um, the IDE, the editor will kind of format the code according to the rules, right? So don't like, don't format the code yourself. Like just give up manual formatting of your code let the tools format your code because it's consistent and it's it follows the conventions. Uh, and most I IDs will kind of do that for you. Um, so go format, code formatting, it's done for you. Go fix, um, it's kind of a useful tool. Like if you have more complex uh, in the hello world, I cannot show you, but if you have a more complex code, run, go fix on it. And it will kind of highlight all the things that you can do better. Um, so you can, you can use it to improve your, your code. Of course, you can use uh, linters. Um, there is a kind of a go lint built in into the tool chain, but it, it, it's, it's very good, but it's limited. Like it has a kind of a limited set of rules that you can control. Uh, the more common um, tool chain for enforcing linters is Golang CI lint. And that's the one which um, uh, some of the IDs are using. And I encourage you to use that one too. Uh, of course, the documentation, it's kind of similar to the typical, you know, um, documentation for the code. Uh, one, again, one small uh, update with Golang is that if you have a function, so for example, if you have, uh, I don't know, some function which adds two numbers uh, or does something, right? And then you write your comments, um, then the kind of... Um, rule of um of the language is that the first word in your comment which then is used for the documentation is the actual name of the function um, so golang has uh coding conventions to distinguish private and publicly exposed apis if you follow the lower letter the lower letter means it's kind of hidden it's package protected it's not visible outside of the of the package but if you have a capital letter then it is public and then linters will enforce for everything that is public to have a comment. And then the comments will enforce that they start with the name of the function, right? And then you say add, you know, does something. So that's the typical pattern that you follow uh, re regarding the coding conventions for documentation. Um, all your public methods will have capital letter, which means this will read like a sentence. And then you start with the name, you repeat the name of the function. Um, so that's how the Go doc kind of does that. And of course you have a built-in testing frameworks. We'll cover tests uh, in the subsequent sections of that course. Um, all right, so IDE, what should you use for the IDE? But uh, before we go there, we will talk a little bit about editor choice, okay? Uh, so there is a question for you. VI, yeah, it's 47 years old now. It's almost uh, as old as me. Um, so a short quiz for you. I told you. All right. So we have kind of a split between uh, haters and lovers. So same amount of people love it and use it. And okay, haters win. Okay, so you will have a kind of a hate-love relationship with them. You will be either kind of loving it or you'll be hating it. Uh, most people actually hate it. Um, so if you never heard of it, you should be kind of hearing about it. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, and, and join the haters. Uh, but if you um, if you think about it rationally, um, you should love it. So I will explain why. 
So let's let's talk first about what good editor should have. What do you expect from a good text editor, which you use for coding predominantly, but you can also use it for writing, you know, your assignments, your English or Norwegian text. What is the editor supposed to be good at that makes it a good editor? Microsoft Word is a terrible editor. <laughs> it's not even an edi editor. <laughs> Are you talking about Emacs as well? Yes, I'm talking about Emacs as well, yeah. But that that's pushing it, right? <laughs> it's kind of like Microsoft Word a little bit. Okay. Um I do, yeah, so autocomplete, uh that that's good. Good good at typing. Okay, that's good also. Um easy key binding support, yes, good for that. Ease of use. Yes, but with some caveats. Um, good terminal support, yeah. I I agree with that. Anything else? Color, yeah. Uh, linting, that's more for the IDE, right? It's not for just editing. Editing is just you kind of entering text, kind of you editing text. Um, so we don't go to more complex things, j just text. Um, Productivity, yes, but what does that mean? What will make you more productive? Autocomplete will make you more productive, indeed. Um, good typing will help, help you. Um, good shortcuts, yes, that will help you. Okay, okay, okay. Those are kind of good. Um, yeah, though, like copilot, highlighting errors, and so on, this is a little bit above what we want from the editor. That's more from the integrated development environment, right, from the IDE. IDE has a subset, which is the editing part, the editor, and then it has those extra additional features for the editor, okay? So for the editor, I think I, I kind of are consistent with your, um, with your focus. So I think the editor, because you're keeping your hands on the keyboard because you're typing text, it has to be focused on the keyboard, right? So the editors which make you move to the mouse a lot will make you less productive and they will make you kind of slower and more clunky and, and so on. So like the first point is editor is to be used with the keyboard and then editors which are keyboard focused typically are better than editors which are not, okay? Um, so keyboard shortcuts, yes, uh, you mentioned that as well. Blog operations, that's a big deal. Like if you're a programmer, you will have to do blog operations a lot. So editor which doesn't support blog operations easily is a kind of nightmare. Like you will be spending a lot of time doing line by line editing, which an editor which has blog support is trivial, right? Don't use editors for coding which don't have block support. Uh, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Um, it should have an ease, easy way of search, right? If um, I can press Control F and search for something that I quickly need, that's kind of good enough. But uh, if I have to click mouse to search for something that I need, that's already kind of uh, disencouraging, okay? Jumping, um, like those two points are important, but most editors have it, okay? I'm not saying the editors which like are really bad at it, but th those things are important. You will be using them a lot. Um, and then speed. Like if I have to edit one letter in my text because I have a typo, I have to change A to O and I have to wait 20 seconds for the thing to boot, do the change and like, you know, seconds to wait to, for it to save. I, I hate it, right? So speed in terms of like quick load, quick uh, edit, quick save cycle is important as well. So those are kind of uh, things which are important for me. And I think they are kind of important in general, uh, but you may have your own list, right? So make your own list and kind of try to find editor which fulfills your own requirements. Um, so editor is important because you will be spending a lot of hours, a lot of time typing stuff, typing text and typing code. Um, so you kind of should pay attention to that. Of course, IDE and IDE features are important as well, 
uh, and some of them you mentioned like code completion and things like that of course those are important but those are be like kind of above already te text that you've typed in uh, and things that you do with text so then uh ide yeah so what do we use for golang um IntelliJ Goland is probably the, uh, the the most favorite for people who want to do Go uh, programming. Um, it's basically IntelliJ with Golang support built in. So for most of you who are doing Golang, uh, you should use this one, and it has a type, TypeScript and JavaScript support built in, such that you can mix Go programming on the server side with some HTML and JavaScript programming for the client, and that, that ID will support that. Uh, but for those of you who are doing programming uh, 206 or have to program in a variety of languages, then I, sub I suggest you uh, install IntelliJ Ultimate and then install the Go plugin. It is almost identical to Goland, but the added benefit is that you have support for other plugins and other programming languages. Uh, so it's sort of a more universal, right? Uh, I don't think... They, there is a kind of a substantial difference between those two uh, with this one being a subset, the first one being a subset of the second one, right? So if you want more, you should go with the second option. Remember that when you are an NTNU student, you can go to IntelliJ website and get the ultimate for free because we have a side license. So you can download the, the free version of ultimate. Uh, and I mean, the paid version of ultimate for free, okay? So then some people use uh, Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is also pretty good. Um, I can show you. So if we write this, no, we cannot write this because we haven't finished our function. So now we can write this. So if I say code main.go, uh, you will have um, your um visual studio code you have code coloring formatting all those features because there is like a um go plugin as well it's pretty good um i i like both um i tend to depending what i need to do if i need to open an editor and edit stuff like in uh, 50 files for a couple of hours then i will go for intellij uh, because it, it is a little bit better in terms of uh, actually um, managing your projects and uh, multi-file kind of support. If I have to edit one file very shortly, I would use Vim, but if I have to do a little bit more, I sometimes use code. It's almost as fast. Um, no, I don't have like very strong preference. Uh, so um, Visual Studio Code is pretty good too. Uh, and of course, you can use uh, Vim. Right, so those of you who are already using Vim, you can use it uh, and you can generate your bindings and your dependencies for different programming languages using uh, Vim Bootstrap. I I didn't check before um, before the lectures and if it still works, but I believe it still works. So you go to a website and then you pick uh, which languages you want your Vim kind of uh, scripts to load. And then you pick them and then generate the kind of a config file for your Vim. And then it will load all the dependencies and all the um, support for that language. Um, so it generates the VimRC for you. Um, I also do like, uh, because, like, because I'm a Vim user, so I like the Vim shortcuts. And then when I'm using, um, so if I'm using the, uh, Visual Studio Code, one of the plugins that I have is the um, Vim plugin, which emulates the keyboard shortcuts and kind of the editor features of Vim inside my Visual Studio Code. So I have the same keyboard shortcuts. I, I can kind of do the same things. And I have the same in IntelliJ. So my kind of F editor and keyboard feel in different IDEs feels the same because I'm kind of reusing the same key keyboard shortcuts and that helps me to remember them. Although if I um, don't use them for a while, then your me muscle memory kind of fades and you have to train yourself again, right? So Vim is a little bit like sport or running. Like if you don't do it for a while, then if you have to get up in the morning and do it, you kind of hate it. But if you're doing it regularly, then it's like a source of joy, right? So yeah, your mileage may, may vary. 
my suggestion to you is like, don't be uh, religious, just try all of it, okay? Try different ideas, try different editors. If somebody tells you about something you haven't heard, like Emacs, try it, okay? Give it some time. Like, you may like it, you may love it. Uh, some people love Emacs, uh, they use it until today. Uh, Ivar, I think, is an Emacs guy. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's for you, right? Whatever someone likes, you may, it's like with, with ice cream, okay? Uh, whatever makes you productive or liking something doesn't mean it, it is universal. It's not. It's very personal. So be kind of open, open-minded, try everything, pick what works for you, right? Don't pick something because everybody else is using it. Just pick something that works for you. So uh, be critical and just do your own research, do your own like tests. Uh, some of them have a very easy learning curve. So you try something and it's very easy to kind of get around and it's easy to start. But then you kind of notice the limitations, right? And some things are kind of harder to start. You, you have a little bit of a learning curve. You have to learn a little bit what to use and how to use it. And then you learn the limitations as well. So the, the point is not comparing the learning curves, but comparing what the limitations are, like what you will gain by switching to a certain tool. Um, yeah, I, I guess you, you got the picture. Okay, so question to you, how to learn a new programming language? What are the strategies? What are the tactics to help you to learn Go for this course quickly in a matter of a couple of weeks? Yeah, YouTube is good. So uh, I want to get fit and I watch a lot of push-ups and uh, pull-ups videos. Uh, will I get fit? I don't think so, right? So watching YouTube is good because you will learn about something, but it's not enough. Like it's not enough to watch something and say, yeah, yeah I know it. Like uh, it looks simple. Like uh, I, I watch the guy typing things and I know it, right? I can type the same. And then you have to type it and it's like, oh, uh, what was that? Like, it's not the same. You, you actually have to type it yourself. You, you have to do it. So when you're watching YouTube, um, I actually suggest you open your own editor and kind of follow follow with, right? So don't just watch it in double speed. Actually, you can watch it double speed, but pause it and kind of try it yourself, like do, do it yourself. Um, so practice, 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 practice. It, it, it is important. Reading is important. Uh, reading and writing, both are symmetrical and important, of course. So what else? Uh, checking examples, yeah, try on another, perfect. Those are good. Um, reading documentation, yes, of course. Uh, the best way to learn idiomatic way of using something, a particular programming language, is to read the examples um, from the documentation. If you read the examples from Stack Overflow, your mileage may vary. Some examples are really bad, they are hacks, and then some examples are very idiomatic and very good. And you will not be able to tell the difference when you're learning because you actually don't know. Like you're learning, so you don't know. So you, by watching some YouTube videos and watching some code on Stack Overflow, you may actually pick up some bad habits, some bad non-idiomatic ways of solving things. So it's actually better to check the documentation uh, because then the authors and the original kind of intent is demonstrated and it's um, almost always very idiomatic. Um, so practice, practice, um, do some projects, of course. Good, good, good. Those are all good suggestions. So start with the basics, practice writing code, build small projects. Perfect. This is a very good suggestion. Start small and kind of a grow. Um, Read the manuals, of course, very good, good suggestions. So I have some suggestions. Um, Go tool, tour is a interactive uh, tutorial for Go and it's very good. Uh, it's kind of designed to guide you through the, uh, the language and you all should do it. So you all should do it um, uh, interactively with the, um, 
with the website or with you, you can run it locally on your on your laptop as well um and you should start with that uh because it's very concise it's very fast and very condensed so instead of reading kind of a more um kind of a spread over uh texts about different things of the language this one kind of is very like to the point uh, so you will be pretty e efficient we need to make a break all right so i will leave you here and let's have uh, how long is the break two minutes you have no. two minutes, <laughs> no. Ten minutes. No, no. all right Ten so yeah let's have 10 minutes is it enough 15 all right so let's do let's cut the deal you do that tour and the break is 15 minutes but you do the tour now <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so let's let's find the middle all right 13 minutes <laughs> okay so let us continue the explorations of the language um so you will do the go tour at home some of you already did it hello okay thanks um some of you already did it. Uh, those of you who did it will have a little bit um, head start. Uh, so we, we, what we will do is we will look into some of the, um, yeah, so we cover that. Um, I learn kind of new programming languages by picking a pet, small pet project. Like if you try to do like um, Fibonacci numbers or, or some sort of small stupid thing, you will kind of do it and that's it. But that doesn't explore the kind of a complexity of the language. So kind of a picking a small kind of a pet project usually is better because then you will cover various aspects of the language. Um, yeah, reading tutorials, reading books for the idiomatic way of solving some things. And then you have to be critical who you watch on YouTube. So there are some, uh, some Go uh, authors who are very in love with Go and they explore kind of a nuance and different things about the language. And those are excellent. And some people say, you know, learn Go in seven minutes or learn Go in seven hours. And those are usually bullshit, right? Uh, they have video for every programming language on the earth with that pattern. Uh, and they are kind of, I, yeah, I mean, your mileage may vary, but my experience is that uh, you have to find someone who is really good in that language and they usually have a very good content and they will have multiple video about Golang and then follow them. Um, so that's kind of my suggestion. All right, so hello world. Um, so some of you, for some of you who did the, um, the tour, this will be a little bit trivial, but maybe you will learn a little bit something new. So how you do hello world in, um, in Go? Um, so the mechanics are very simple. Um, before we do that, uh, how you should play with Go. Um, so if we go to Go Tour, um, you will see we have uh, an editor here. Uh, so sometimes when I really quickly need to check if my syntax is okay uh, for something, I will just use this, okay? So I will kind of go here and do uh, stuff in here. So if, if I say, format uh, print line hello world then if i format my code and if i run it it will run so it's kind of easy right you don't even need to have an access to like you can do it on your phone right you don't need to have access to anything really um so this is kind of a good way of testing uh so that's hello world, right? Uh, we have to declare a package, um, uh, same as in um, other programming languages. You kind of your code lives in some sort of namespace, and it's um, 
kind of um, embedded in some sort of a namespace, which forms a, a package visibility for the constructs which are in that package. Um, in some languages, the namespaces and modularity of the visibility are kind of two separate things. Uh, in Golang, they are the same thing. So the, the package is the namespace you, you kind of live. And it, it has a hierarchy. So you can have a kind of, um, same as in Java or other programming languages, you can have nested packages. So one package can be a child of another package, right? Um, the entry point to any Go program is a main function. And the main function has to live in the main package. So you cannot have main living in a non-main, uh, uh, sorry, you can have main living in a non-main package, but then this program will not be executable. To make it executable, to make it able to run the code, the main has to be in the main package. Um, uh, and a package is like a directory. Um, so you cannot have two different packages in the same folder, in the same directory. So in, in here, when we have our example actually on the file, um, file system, you can see that I have a folder. Um, so I have a folder called hello world, which lives somewhere. It lives in the top level um, folder of the PROC 2005-2023 code base from the repo from uh, Christopher uh, um, GitLab repository. And then I have a folder called hello world. And then my, um, my file lives there. So if I create a second file, so let's create a second file called um, uh, hello world. Um, so let's in hello world.go and let's delete that function. Oh, let's keep that function, but let's rename it to hello world. Oh, I have two files, right? Um, I have two files. I have a hello world file and I have a main.go file. This file is in the hello world package. This file is in the main package. If I try to build it, um, it will uh, complain uh, that I don't have a module declared yet. So I will go go mod init hello world. I will declare a, a module. Um, what does that do? It creates a new file called go mod. And what is go mod? Uh, go mod is two lines of text. It has module hello world. And then which version of Go supposed to come with that module? So my module now is called hello world. And it consists of two files, hello world.go and main.go. Um, and to build it, the minimum required version is 119. It doesn't have any external dependencies. If we do have external dependencies, then they will be listed in that file. So now if I try to build it, uh, it will say, found packages hello world and main in this folder, right? You cannot have two packages in the same folder. So you typically organize your code in such a way that you have um, the, the uh, folder name the same as the package name and you put the code related to that package there. So in my case, I will make a directory called hello world and I will move my hello world.go into that um, folder, right? So now I have my top level is um, hello world, which is the module. And the module is described here and the module is called hello world. It's already getting a little bit confusing. And then I have a folder inside the module, which is called hello world, which is called hello world. And that is a package of my hello world module. A module is a kind of a unit which gets compiled into an executable or gets compiled into a library. And it's something that you distribute. So a module is something that you make kind of distributable as a Git kind of an entry point or as a library or as an executable, right? Uh, can you have multiple executables in the module? Yes, you can. Uh, there is a pattern for that. We usually create, uh, um, so 
So to have multiple executables, we create a folder called uh, make beer command. And then inside this command, we create subfolders for each command that becomes an executable, right? So if I go there, uh, so if I go command and then I create a folder called, okay, so you can create a folder, but if your executables are a single file sources, you don't need a folder because you can just create a, a file, right? So if I create, if I have two executables, one called server uh, and one called client, um, I can have them here. So <clears throat> I have now a package called command and that package or folder and that has two files, one called client, one called server. They will be both in the package main and they will both have a main function and Golang will compile them into client and server executables. So now I will have two executables out of this uh, if I have main inside those two files. But if you want to have an executable, which is a more than one source file, then you would have to create a folder here, which has more files inside. Does it, that make sense? Uh, I'm speaking kind of fast, but that, those are relatively simple things. So what is not clear? If you have a single executable, usually you keep the main in the top level. Uh, you don't create a command folder, you just have it here. If you require two executables, then by convention, usually you create a command folder and you put the executables here and they have to be in the package main. So inside client.go, you say package main and inside server, you say package main and then you have a main function, right? Okay, and then all the logic can live here in the top level or you can have it in the package. If you have it in the package, then this file, uh, requires um, to have the package which matches the folder in which it is. So then I have a package hello world and I have some functions here. One of the functions is called main, but uh, this, will, this file will not become an executable because this main function is in the hello world, not in the main. So let's try to compile it. Um, so if I uh, go build, everything um so it tried to build my module and my module is called hello world and because the output of the building the module will be the name of the module i have only one executable then it says i cannot create a hello world executable in here because you already have a folder called hello world so let's rename um Let's rename my hello world folder to hello folder and let's build it. And it succeeded and it built me a single executable, which is called hello world. Where this name came from, like the executable is main in the module main with the function main, but the name is hello world. That name comes from go mod. So go mod says what that module name is. The name is here. So this name and this name match when you just build your, your project. Um, so I create an executable from this because I've built those two, um, uh, two files. I didn't use anything from hello and I didn't use anything from command. So, and command files are empty. So it didn't bother to kind of complain about anything. All right, so hello world is becoming already a little bit complicated. Like, Printing hello world to the world is easy. It's just like uh, you're using a, a public function spelled with capital P on top of a module, which is called FMT. It's a built-in module into the language and you can import it by doing this import. Um, so I know what FMT refers to because I did the import. And then you call public function on the module by capital letters functions. What other functions FMT module has? Well, if you go to Golang um, documentation um, and you say, go to standard library and you search for FMT, you will see all the public functions which are available here. 
So there is some explanations of how you format things, how everything works, and the list of functions is here. And print line is here, and it you know, returns an int and an error if something went wrong. So you can read what print line actually does and how you use it. And usually they have examples, and those examples are idiomatic way of how you use Go. So pretty much that's all you need. You don't really need to search anything else uh, for the syntax and for idiomatic way of solving certain things. So you can see how things can be concatenated and how you can uh, um, embed strings and some uh, other types into your print line. Okay, so hello world is covered. Um, Okay, so we did hello world the, the very sim simple way by, by basically copying so uh, that code into a single main file, right? So our main dot go is basically the, uh, the workhorse of the implementation. And now the task is let's do something else. Let's write a function in utils.go that prints hello world and then call it from main.go such that we have kind of this dependency. We have to tell main.go from where it should use that function, right? So we kind of doing a little bit more um, involved implementation instead. So for that, what we will do is we already have the structure. Uh, I will delete that because that was only a side comment about uh, okay, let's remove command. Okay, so we have um, main, and in main, we will be calling a function which lives in our hello package. And in the hello package, we implement a public function which exposes some functionality, right? Fine, so we go to hello. Uh, we will edit our, I will rename hello world to hello. So I will uh, rename hello world go to hello.go. And then um, we will uh, use it. Okay, so now my package is called hello and we will use FMT and we'll have a function called my print and it will be basically the same as um, it will be using the print line and we'll pass a parameter. So there will be some strings uh, S which we will print, okay? Very trivial implementation. Uh, my print is um, with capital letter, so it's exposed. And then I will write a idiomatic comment, uh, prints the string out to the screen. Perfect. So we are all good with hello and with um, main. Now we're not going to be adding anything. We are, and we don't need this one anymore. What we will be doing is we'll be using uh, my print, right? But my print as a symbol doesn't exist here. So if I try to compile it, then my ID is already complaining that this is unknown, right? Undeclared name, undeclared name, my print, right? So we have to tell Golang that where to fetch the symbol, where, where the symbol lives. So I will say import. Um, and now that is kind of a source of confusion. Um, there are two conventions. One convention is you point to a Git repo of where your package lives to point to tell Git um, to tell Golang where it can fetch the Git repository from. And usually it, it is in a form of a, a string which says Git something um, and then like dot com, you know, something, something. And that is a top level of the um, like th th this, this something top level one is the project name of the 
module that has been exposed to the world. It's, it has to be in a public Git repository. And then you say, in our case, that's the hello world module. So in our case, that would be hello world, hello world. And then you say hello, right? Because the final path of the path to get to my uh, implementation is hello. And then in here, I would use hello. So here the symbol to use is the last part of the path. Um, but I haven't put my code on the Git yet. It's not publicly available on any server. It's just a local copy. So for that, there is a second convention. And the second convention is that you basically use the name of your module followed by the path of where it is. So in, in this case, we just say hello world because that's our root module. Uh, and then we say hello from there, right? Um, some people get confused because they think this is like a relative path, disk path of where the package is. It has nothing to do with disk. I, I mean, it has to do with disk because this package, like this package lives as in a subfolder of this module, but you start from the module name, uh, not from the disk. Um, it, 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 like you don't, Golang doesn't have a notion of a disk, like in C or C++ where you say, go up the directories and fetch me somewhere there and then go down and fetch me somewhere here. No, you cannot do that. You, you have to start with a module. Um, so that's how you would do it. Uh, and then if we do that, then my ID is happy. Like it says, oh, okay, now I know. I know what, what you mean. I know where to fetch the hello from. So if we save it and if we say go build uh, and if we check it, uh, sorry, I have to say go build here. And if we check it, then I have my hello world implementation done. And if we run it, hello, ay, ay, ay. hello world, it basically does the same thing, right? But inside my main, um, I don't have a printout. I don't use a format, the, the system level package anymore. I'm using my own function which lives in the other package. Does that make sense? So that's how you organize your code. You typically have just one executable. So you basically create uh, a main entry point in the top level of your folder structure. So you create it here and usually you keep it simple. You keep it small. You just call something to bootstrap your, your code. And then you hide all the logic inside, inside some folder structure, pack package structure, which is kind of here. And then your files will be kind of here. I can have multiple files here and each file will be kind of, um, if I have multiple files here, they, they will all be inside package hello and they will be kind of exposing or not exposing some functionality to the outside. They will form kind of an API for me, right? Understood? So that's kind of a pattern which I will uh, save. I will commit that, that structure to the uh, Git repo after the um, class. And then that's the kind of a default uh, one which uh, we typically use. All right, so we have, um, oh yeah, so I did it like both files are in the same main package, but I already skipped that and I've, uh, I've done this one uh, where the util is in a separate package, right? Okay, so we have covered that. So um, Golang doesn't have um, inheritance, but it has object orientation. So what does that mean? It means it has a concept of an object and which in Golang is a struct and it has an ability for you to call methods on that object, right? Um, so it has kind of a, a, a way of distinguishing between a function which takes arguments and the function it kind of lives in, a, um, in a, its own space. It doesn't refer to anything apart from the things that you pass as parameters and the method, which is always attached to a, some sort of a data structure, which it manipulates. So it, it say, it, it's the same in, um, in C or C++, but we don't use that uh, terminology that strictly. Uh, here, you kind of need to use it more strictly. So sometimes you say, I have a class with this function, uh, 
don't in go in, in go you don't we don't say that we say we have a type or struct or a class sometimes we call that class with a method and the method is attached to that particular type to that particular struct um, if you have a function, it means it's not attached to any data structure. It, it lives in its own kind of space, and then you have to pass parameters to what the function will be manipulating. Uh, so, for example, um, let's go to code so I keep the editor in. So, for example, what do i need to click yes i do trust that okay so if i you have a basic function here right so that's a function it's not a method because this function is not attached to any data structure um all right and then it has interfaces so let's ha let's have a look um how we would define kind of a typical object oriented pattern that you are all familiar with uh, from Java or from uh, C++, where we have um, a function or a method, be precise, method, which is different for depending on the type that we use. So we want to use kind of like a, a polymorphic uh, ability for a method to be attached to a different type. And then we have uh, a generic uh, rectangular shape and we have a circular shape. And then an area is like the implementation of the area is different for the rect rect rectangles and for cir circles, right? But in our data structure, we want to hold shapes. We want to hold any shapes and then calculate area. So we want to have an iteration, which kind of a prints the area of either a circle or a rectangle, right? So what we would do, we would generate kind of an, an abstraction, which says there are things on which you can calculate area, right? Generically speaking, right? It doesn't say if it's circular or rectangular or, you know, um, rhomboid or whatever that is. We just know we can calculate an area of a shape. Uh, and that thing becomes an interface. And then we have two data structures. We have rectangles and circles. For rectangle, we need, uh, you know, width and, and uh, height. And for circle, we just need radius. Uh, and then the area is calculated for rectangle by multiplication and for circle with the uh, pi square, right? Pi square right, radius. So no, no, no magic here. And then uh, we can uh, have a function which given an instance of a geometry prints the area, right? And this is kind of a polymorphic type because we can pass anything that is a geometry. So here I created a rectangle and here I created a, a circle and I pass rectangle and circle and it works by magic, right? Because I never said rectangle and circle are instances of this geometry, right? So how that, does that happen? In Golang, you don't have to say it. In Golang, the runtime system and the type inference system will infer if your data structure fulfills a particular interface, as long as it has implemented all the methods for that interface. So as you see, uh, a normal function, it would be uh, without that first part, you would say func area and then the return type, and then you will be calculating something based on the parameters passed here. But when you're creating a method, you pass this first parameter, and this first parameter re references for which object this method is. So in our case, this method area is for rectangles because we say, pass me a, a rectangle reference here. Um, and for circle, that, that method is for the circle, right? So because rectangles implement a method called area, they are geometry by just by sheer uh, you know, coincidence of this name coinciding with this name. Um, the same with circle. In Java and in other programming languages, you have to say my rectangle is of particular interface. And then you implement the methods of those interface to make sure that the implementation is there. In Golang, you don't have to do that. It's just inferred from the runtime system. 
So you can declare kind of a generic types uh, by interface and then hook them up to particular data structures by the coincidence of this name being the same as the interface that you're implementing. Can you have multiple names, uh, multiple um, uh, methods inside your geometry interface? Of course you can. Typically, Go tries to minimize and uh, maximize the reuse by making interfaces very simple. So instead of, let's say you want to um, calculate a, a area and you want to calculate the circumference of the particular shape. So you have two, you, you would like to have two functions, right? Um, so then uh, you could have uh, an area and circumference names here, and they make those two structs implement both. But that's less flexible than having two interfaces declared, and then those two shapes implementing both of them, and then you only use the one that you need, right? If we have a geometry that says um, both of those names, and we pass geometry here, but we only need an area, then why are we passing circumference? Like, you know, there is kind of a principle in software engineering where you try to minimize of what you're passing. Like if, if you're passing something to someone and they don't need it, you should not be passing it to them, right? So if we are passing like geometry, which has both two things, area and circumference to something that only use area, then we should not do that. So you should refactor it and have um, two interfaces one which is responsible for circumference, one which is responsible for um, area. You would have implementation of all the methods here. So the rectangle and circle will implement both shapes, but here you will only pass the one which is needed, right? So what if you need both? What if you need kind of a both uh, at the same time? Then the geometry solution with two names is, is good one, right? But you will see when you're reading other people code, you will see that interfaces in Golang tend to be very short, uh, tend to be like um, um, one-liners uh, often. That almost never happens in Java. Like in Java, usually the interfaces are quite bulky, uh, but here they usually are quite short, but you can mix, you can mix it. They, they, there is no restriction of how many methods you will have here. Um, does that feel okay? There is no inheritance, right? So I cannot have nested interfaces, like one interface inheriting from another interface, and I cannot have structs which inherit from another struct. That there is no concept of inheritance. So how we deal with that? How we deal, let's say I have a concept of a point which has um, uh, two properties, X and Y. That's fine. And then I have a concept of a circle which has a middle, which is X and Y and a radius. And I would like not to repeat myself to say circle also has X and Y and the radius. I would like to say circle is the same as point, but it, so it has X and Y and a radius, right? Um, how we would achieve that? Well, you do that through composition instead, right? So, okay, let me, let me, okay, that's, uh, that's not in that context. So let me write it for you. So if I have, Okay, so let's make it bigger. Um, how much time I have? Seven minutes. All right, so I think we can make it. So let's go back to the rectangle area. So we, we defined a rectangle to have width and height, but instead let's, let's have a type which is um, um, a point, which is a struct. And our struct has uh, x, x and y, okay? And they will be right, whatever you want. They they can be um, floats. What did we use here? We use float sixty four. So for consistency, let's just float sixty four. Okay. So now I I would like to have uh, a concept of a circle, and of course without inheritance, you may think, okay, I don't have. No, normally, if you have inheritance, you would have inherit from, you know, uh, from point, and then you would kind of say, I have a radius, uh, which is also a float, okay? 64. 
Um, and then uh, you would expect a circle. So if I if I make myself um, um, if I do myself like a circle like this, um, so I say circle uh, is circle, and then it has a radius of um, five, and it has x of zero and y of zero, right? Uh, you would expect that to work, but Golang doesn't have inheritance. That, that, that pattern would be kind of typical to C++ or Java. Uh, so what do you do without inheritance? Well, you basically say um, Golang has a point of type point. Sorry, 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 Strike. right? So now what we did is we said, uh, we have R, which is a float, and we have P, which is a reference to a point which has X and Y, which we inherited, not really inherited, but kind of composed from point, right? So we have a point data structure, which has X and Y, and now we have a circle, which has P dot X and P dot Y, and then we would not declare it like this, but we would have to say p dot p dot, right? So we would declare a circle which has uh, a point, or we could do point like this. Uh, So that is a little bit tedious because you do need to remember what that reference handle is. So to make it streamline, Golang has a kind of a shortcut where you can completely remove the name and embed your point um, in, a, in a way that looks as if Um, X and Y lives in the top level namespace, right? So it's a syntactic shortcut for the composition of the embedded structure inside your struct, which pretends that it's a single flat structure, but in fact, it's a nested structure, right? But you use it as if it's a flat structure. So you kind of feel, okay, it, it looks like I do have inheritance, right? But you don't but it kind of feels like you do. And you, you, you kind of use it the same way as you would use it if you had kind of a Java or um, C++ construct saying circle inherits from point, right? But we don't have inheritance, we have composition. So you kind of uh, embed things that you need from another type and then you kind of use it. So that's how, how, you, um, that's how, how you would use it. Uh, let me do that. Um, so it complains about C not being used and it complains uh, that my point X and Y um, are unknown. So let me, uh, let me print C. So we have this one go, go away and let me see what is the syntax that I have to use for declaring the point. Uh, for a nested literal that I'm using here. Uh, yeah, so I have to admit, I don't exactly remember the syntax of how you would embed the, those two things. Uh, we would have to check it. So um, let's say, um, nested structs go like how to initialize a nested struct let's go to uh, uh this one is with the proxy so that's uh yeah so you basically have to use the name uh you do have to use the point um, 
and the point I believe the point is like this. No. Uh, I have to make those public. Right, so yeah, we're running out of time and I'm kind of trying to find the syntax. So you will have to do it as a homework, uh, but the concept is, is the same. So that uh, that composition is kind of a, a workaround around the limitation of not having the uh, inheritance. So that's all for today. And um, we will continue with some of the uh, functional patterns next time and with the uh, type system. Thank you.